purpose of Masonic infiltration and the purpose of communist changing of culture. In the beginning, you need the torture and you need the, the, the guard to stand there with the water guy. But after a time, the guard can go take a break. After a time, he can go on vacation. You need the mason in the beginning to watch over things and to make sure that things are guided in a new direction. But after a time, the mason can leave. You will notice, for instance, in America, that the Masonic lodges are in every single one of our towns. If the town has three people in it, two of them are masons, and there's a Masonic lodge. There may not be a gas station, there may not be a convenience store, but there is a lodge. And there, in that, you're finding now when you visit those lodges, the average age of the Masonic, the mason in the Masonic lodge is about 102. There are just like the nuns and the convents and like the monks. Does that mean masonry is dying? Absolutely not. The masons have achieved their purpose. They have changed the monkeys. They have changed the people to think like masons, to act like masons, even though they don't know what a mason is. They never joined a masonic lodge, and they never studied masonry. But they have been changed. Enter the fifth monkey. The fifth monkey is... Michael Back. The fifth monkey is Chris Ferrara. The fifth monkey is the neocon movement. They enter in and they say, well, you see, what's the problem with the church? The problem is not Vatican II. The problem isn't, we heard that once upon a time, that if you reach for the truth, this water gun of Vatican II blasted you. And you were a heretic and you were a schismatic and you had to believe in these modern heresies. You had to believe in these modern errors. But in fact, that's not the problem. Because yesterday I tried to reach for a banana and all happened, another monkey beat me up. If only we had nice monkeys, everything would be fine. The problem is there's too many mean monkeys in the world. And all we got to do is make nice monkeys and then we can all eat bananas. This is the problem. So here we are. We're in the age of the fifth monkey. All these monkeys are gathering together. They're all gathering in Steubenville. It's a good place for them to meet. They're all gathering together where they have the, where they have the Scott Hahn is nearby and the whole conservative movement of EWTN is nearby. They're meeting right there in order to appeal to those people conservative, standard, double sort of movement that's not traditional. And then you have the so-called traditional movement. They're all gathered together to say, you know what the problem is? The problem is those monkeys in the Vatican. We're all a bunch of mean monkeys. That's the problem. The problem is we've got cardinals and bishops who have an attitude that's a problem. They have a spirit that's a problem. This is the attitude and the spirit of Vatican II. You can see a little catacombs interview of Michael Matt and uh, and uh, the Christopher Ferrara just a few days, just a short time ago, and it's on the internet. It's on the website of the uh, Remnant newspaper. And in that catacomb interview, they point out a Rome Reports article or a Rome Reports uh, news report, and Rome Report says 80, almost 80 signatures signed a document that said that Pope Francis is guilty of seven heresies. These signatures reject Vatican II. And Michael Matt and, well, and Chris Ferrara, who have become now icons of Catholic tradition, they respond and say, look, how come they're saying that you reject Vatican II? To say that you're against Pope Francis doesn't mean you're against Vatican II. And Chris Ferrara says, well, I'm a Catholic. I believe the teachings of the Catholic faith. I believe what the Catholic faith teaches, what the Catholic Church teaches. And therefore, I don't accept heterodox teaching. It's not about Vatican II. It's a meaningless statement. We reject Vatican II. What does it mean? We quote unquote reject Vatican II. The statement has no meaning. Except this. You're not one of the chosen guys. That is, you're not one of the mean monkeys. You're not one of the chosen guys. You're not part of this movement that is the liberalization of the Catholic Church. When we say that we reject Vatican II, all we mean is that we reject 
the liberalization of the Vatican of the new of the Catholic Church. That's what we mean. We know there was a council. And when you look at that council, you see that there's no actual dogmatic statement in the council that says you must believe this proposition. So therefore, it's a non-dogmatic council. It's only an expression of an attitude and a spirit and a pastoral direction. And no man can be held to believe in a spirit or a pastoral direction. So therefore, there's no errors or heresies in the council. The council has been a disaster. The council has been terrible. The council has been awful. How has it been awful and terrible? Because the spirit of that council and the direction of that council has been awful. And we have people in the church today who have the spirit of the council in them. They must remove that spirit. Now, these are the statements that should come from a mason. These are statements that should come from a card-carrying Satanist. They are statements that should come from a communist who is being paid by the Politburo to say these foolish things. They're not. They're coming from monkeys. They are coming from men that are not wicked. They're coming from men that are not ill, evil, and not guilty. Coming from men that have a, have a clean conscience. What is the effect? You have a young boy, 18 years old. Another young boy, 18 years old. One of them meets the local girl with 5,000 tattoos, spots from the various drug inj injections, and is a local prostitute. He falls madly in love. The other 18-year-old boy meets a really nice Protestant girl who's deeply religious and spiritual and nice. Which one loses the faith forever? The one that met the Protestant girl. Eventually, when you when you were the prostitute and a rotten girl and an evil girl, you wait, I can't stay this way. I have to leave this evil life. And you go back to the truth. But the nice girl who believes in doctrines that lead the souls of her children and her husband to hell. The nice girl that is nicely belonging to the kingdom of Satan, that girl stays glued to the boy and he loses his faith and he never comes back. How does the revolution get sealed? It was pointed out by Father Giselle back in 2012. He says we're in the stage of the thermidization or the burning in of the revolution. How does a revolution get sealed? If a revolution requires the guy with a gun to always be there, the revolution is a failure. If the revolution requires the communist leader to always be implementing his communism, the revolution is a failure. The way the revolution succeeds is by getting the ordinary man, and especially the good man, and the just man, to believe in the lies of the revolution, to believe in the errors of the revolution, why did the fifth monkey not reach for a banana? Because there was a guard with a water hose who was a jerk. <laughs> it was not because of the other monkeys. There was a man with a water hose that sprayed whoever reached for a banana. That's the problem. And the water hose is still there. They don't reach for the banana. The other monkeys beat them up. But why do they beat them up? Because there's a water hose and a mean guard. The water hose can be shut off. The mean guard can go on vacation. But it's still the reason. And it caused the problem. In our situation in the church today, we have a very grave problem. One in which we are seeing what the prophecy of St. Francis of Assisi fulfilled. That the deceit shall grow so far that it will deceive, if possible, even the elect. We are at the stage now where the good men are telling us, forget about the council. The council is a dead letter. Even my own brother, another priest of the Society of Pius X, are saying, Pope Francis has gone beyond the council. Pope Francis is worse than the council. Is he? Is he? Modernism has been a heresy for our 200 years in the church. Condemned by St. Pius X in 1907. The modernists of 1907, what did they say? All religion must be eradicated. There is no Catholic God. There is no morality indicated by the church. It's an invention only of men. Morality is invented by us. 
Therefore, homosexuality is good. Marriage is evil. All the wicked things that are promoted today were promoted by them in 1907. Condemned by St. Pius X in 1907. This is not new. Pope Francis is not a new heretic. Pope Francis is not implementing a new religion. He is simply putting into practice the heresies and the errors of Vatican II. Vatican II is the problem. It was created by human beings who are masons, and masonry is still the problem today. But the masonry now is a more serious problem today because the Masonic actions, the Masonic thinking, the Masonic direction is now being run by non-masons who don't like masons. The neocon movement, the false resistance, the false movement of the conservatives, these are the greatest soldiers today in the kingdom of Satan. They are the ones who are making sure that whoever rises up against the devil will not shoot at him. Whoever rises at the devil will shoot at straw men. Consider one important statement of, 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 of Chris Ferrara and Michael Matt in that interview, their little remnant interview of a few days, a few weeks ago, or week and whenever, very recently. We're against an attitude, a liberalization of the church. What is liberalization? It's an ongoing, moving thing. Liberalization, a changing, a movement, a change, a negative change. Can you stop every liberal? Where, where do we start? Where does liberalization, when is liberalization acceptable and when is it unacceptable? You could say, for instance, liberalization of the church might be, for instance, to move a feast day, like they did in the 1950s, to move a feast day. Liberalization might be to add a genuflection where there shouldn't be one or to put or remove a genuflection where there should be one. Liberalization might be something which Pius XII did in 1945. He changed the Psalter from the original Psalter of, of uh, Jerome, St. Jerome, to the new Psalter of Cardinal Bayeux. And so that new Psalter is in all breviaries from 1945 to 1961. All breviaries during that period have a new Psalter. There's no heresy in that Psalter. It's just the words are all different. It's a liberalization. What liberalization, where do we stop? Some people will say, well, the liberalization of changing anything, we're going to reject. Others will say, well, the liberalization of dogma, we're going to accept, but liberalization of morals, we're not going to accept. Others will say, we'll accept liberalization up to 25%, but not up to 32%, up to 49%, but not up to 73%. Where does it start? Where does it stop? There's no beginning and there's no end. There's no clear doctrine. To answer mush with mush creates more mush. It doesn't fix anything. There is a doctrinal problem. That is, Vatican II and the new church teaches something against Jesus Christ and it must be condemned completely. There is error and there is heresy in the council and there is no way in which you can have a pastoral instruction without a dogma. Here's a, here a pastoral instruction. Don't touch my Lamborghini. That's a pastoral instruction. Don't touch it. It's just a directive. Is there any doctrine in it? There's a lot of doctrine in it. The principal doctrine is, I own that car. Another doctrine is, there's a car there. If a, if a beggar tells you, don't touch my Lamborghini, don't worry about it. Number one, he doesn't have a Lamborghini, and if it is, it's not his. He's lying. There is a doctrine. The doctrine is, I own something, it is mine. The owner has the right to say who can touch it, who can't touch it. If the owner says, don't touch it, you can't touch it. He's either telling the truth, and he really owns the car, or he's telling a lie, in which case he doesn't own the car. If he tells the truth, his doctrine is right, and the moral Do, a statement, don't touch my Lamborghini, is a correct statement. <laughs> If the Lamborghini doesn't exist, or it's not his car, then because of the doctrinal error, you can touch it. 
There is no possibility of making any pastoral directive which does not have a doctrinal uh, foundation and which is not necessarily doctrinal. It is impossible to make a statement that is not doctrinal. Therefore, to say that Vatican II is a pastoral and not doctrinal council is absurd. To say that there is no teaching in Vatican II, and therefore we can say it's not heretical, is absurd. When we say that all religions, are, that the Catholic religion subsists in the, Catholic, in the true church, it means that there's other religions may also subsist in the true church. That's a heresy. When we say that non-Catholics can receive Holy Communion if they believe in the Blessed Sacrament, it means that non-Catholics are in the state of grace, friends of God, having the true faith, which is a lie, and that they thereby, being united us in faith, may receive Holy Communion. These are doctrinal errors. They are heresies. And therefore, it's a mortal sin and a sacrilege for a Protestant to receive Holy Communion. But the new code of canon law says he can. And the same is true of the other pastoral directions that are immoral, contained in the sacred, contained in the modern teachings. They all have a doctrinal foundation. Can you bury your, your grandma with ashes? Can you bury your gra ashes in the church? Oh, yes, you can. If you can bless grandma's ashes, what does that mean? It means it is moral to desecrate the body of grandma. It means it's moral to obliterate and treat with the most vile disrespect the body of the temple that is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And that's an error. That is against God. There is no moral statement, there is no pastoral directive that is not doctrinal. And now we find Catholics. What makes us Catholic? We find Catholics telling us we can still hold our truth and not worry about the pastoral directives of Vatican II and not consider them as doctrines. What does St. Athanasius tell us in his creed? Unless a man believes all and holds wholly and firmly every doctrine of the church, without doubt he must perish. It matters what we believe. Now we have Society of St. Pius X priests gathering together with indult priests, gathering together with the Fraternity of St. Peter. The Fraternity of St. Peter was formed specifically to destroy us. It's like Lucifer and St. Michael getting together for an identity conference. We are enemies standing on two different sides of the fence. One is with God and the other is not, or the other is with God and the one is not. But if they are both together, then both are against God. For God is never the friend of the, of the enemy. He is never standing together with the enemies of Christ, the enemies of the truth. Where do we go from here? It's a psychological message. The days of you traditional Catholics fighting against Vatican II, it's over. Nobody talks about Vatican II anymore, so forget about it. Let's just start with where do we go from here? You can think Vatican II is bad. I can think Vatican II is good. Or I can think Vatican II is bad. You can think it's good. No one cares. It's just an attitude. It's just a spirit. What matters is, what are we going to do about Cardinal Burke? What are we going to do about Cardinal Mueller? What are we going to do about Pope Francis? What are we going to do about the real problems of today, which are those people? And yet, when our ancestors stood in front of emperors and were put to death, what do they say? What I believe is what matters, and what you believe is what matters. The sacred truth is what matters, and what destroys is the lie of the devil. We love all individuals. We love Pope Francis. We love Cardinal Mueller. We want all of them to repent and come back to God if they are his enemy. We want them to remain faithful if they are his friend. But we know that whoever believes in his heart, the lie of the devil must be damned. Whoever believes in his heart, the truth of God must be saved and operates firmly according to it. Hence, it really matters. The doctrine and all other things flow from it. And when we find <coughs> Catholics gathering together in unity, what unity? Father Luke is going to be there at the conference next week. He's a vagus, according to Rome. He's not approved. He doesn't say Mass in an approved church. He doesn't have paperwork that says he's approved. And yet he'll be there with the approved priest, and they're all going to approve of each other. And they're all going to talk nice things. Guaranteed. 
Guaranteed, the most Catholic conference, the most Catholic content will not be found in the SSPX priest. It won't be found there. Look at Amoris Letizia. In Amoris Letizia, rather, the document written by 40 Novus Ordo priests and 40 Novus Ordo theologians. They say clearly and explicitly, Pope Francis, you taught seven heresies. These heresies must be condemned. Now look at the exact same commentary made by Bishop Follet, Father Glez, and Father Godron, the priest of the society, the official SSPX commentary. Pope Francis's Amoris Letizia is not heretical, but it's dangerous, it's imperfect, it can be understood in the wrong way. SSPX says, not heretical, dangerous, can be understood in an imperfect way, be concerned. Novus Ordo Priest says, seven heresies. And by the way, there's more than seven heresies, they say. We're just enunciating these seven. The Novus Ordo Priest speaks clearly. The Novus Ordo Priest speaks the truth. And the traditional priest speaks blah, 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 blah. Mm. Speaks like an adult on peanuts. Mm. Now, but the fact is, this is not the way of Christ. Corruptio optimi pessimi. The corruption of the best is the worst. We can't have this. We can't have this. Let's stand for the sacred truth and realize we're in a dogmatic fight. Yes, the Freemasons started it. But now the good people are thinking like Freemasons. Vatican II is the heresy. And now we're saying forget about Vatican II. But it's still the reason why the monkeys are beating each other up. It's still the reason for our crisis. And so let's stand with Christ and not with this Antichrist. What is he? He's a monkey. The fathers tell us that. That he is the devil and the Antichrist are the ape of Christ. They'll look a little bit like him, but they're apes. They're not human. They're not divine. They're demonic. Don't act like an ape. Don't act like a monkey. Don't monkey see, monkey do. But follow the teaching of Christ. Follow the way of our ancestors. Stand firmly for the truth and hold it firmly in our hearts. And then we will live forever, the friends of God, and survive the great charming chastisement. St. Francis, Francis says in his prophecy before he died, when the time of the test comes, because they didn't stand for the truth, they shall fail. We must stand for the truth, stand firmly for the truth, and when the proving and testing comes, Our Lady will give us the strength through her being the mediators of all grace, come out the other side victors with Christ. So let us bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.